Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlotte and I am our senior program manager here at Factor Berlin. So at Factor Berlin, our vision is to give every creator an empowering network. Uh, network is a core part of who we are, it is what we do. And with no further ado, I'd like to pass the microphone to our moderator, Katya, who is an entrepreneur, angel, investor, and podcast host. Thank you so much and enjoy this event. Thanks, Charlotte. It's great to be here previously to becoming all that. Charlotte said, I've been working for Spotify for over 11 years for the streaming service. So I guess that qualifies me to be the humble moderator of this panel tonight. And it's, it's great to be here. I guess we would all agree that audio is an integral part of our everyday lives. So we all receive voice messages all the time. We could not imagine driving the car without voice interfaces from, from the GPS, from the navigation. We could not imagine how to be without Google Home, Alexas and the likes. So it's absolutely normal that also startups are leaning towards audio, searching for new innovative ways to enhance our lives, make our mental well-being better, get more creative, get more social and maybe even meet a romantic partner through voice technology. So in our panel tonight, we would love to explore how, how we can use audio technology to enhance our life and to, to do all these magical things, how to empower artists with audio and AI, how to meet interesting people, how to feel better, how to be more productive, how to be more relaxed, how to be more social, creative, and just how to have more fun in life in general. And uh, audio is a really super powerful tool. And we want to discuss and explore how how we can uh, use the whole power of it together with like human creativity and AI, like infusing all these elements into it. So we have a stellar speaker lineup uh, today for that. So we have um, Kalam Ali, who is a co-founder of Sound Obsessed and Soul Lab X, which is a creative community exploring new types of expression with generative art and sonic experiences. Hi, Kalam. Nice to have you here. Then we have Oleg Alex Davidsky, who is the CEO of Ando, which is a personalized soundscape app. So powered hey, by AI, which helps you relax, sleep, and focus. And then last but not least, we have uh, Francisca, Francisca Fogen. Hello who is the CEO of Waves. Waves is audio dating app that helps you to find a perfect romantic match based on voice, voices you like. So I think there's three of you, you have uh, one thing, you have quite a few things in common. You're all Berlin-based founders and you're all pushing the boundaries of audio and AI, creating human or artist-centric products. So. Let's uh, let's dive in into our discussion and please tell us what was the initial sparkle for your company idea and what is the offering right now. So I would like to start. I don't know, we can go this way, we can do ladies first. Or, let's yeah. go ladies first. Let's do ladies first, yeah. Um, yeah, it's so old school, ladies first, that it's in again to say <laughs> ladies first, I feel. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, Waves, I'm CEO of Waves, uh, Waves the audio dating uh, app, and yeah, I hate online dating, <laughs> that's the reason why I did it, I just really love to meet people in real life and check out their vibe and see, you know, if it <laughs> matches, and then came Corona, and yeah, this was not possible anymore, so um, I need to... I need to restart dating. <laughs> that was sucked so much. I couldn't believe that it's still that shitty to uh, yeah meet people online. And it really, I mean, the interface from Tinder and Pumble didn't really change the last 12 years. So, I mean, that's crazy. So, Around yeah. For 12 years already? That's but crazy. There a long yeah. time. Yeah. But yeah, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't know. <laughs> um, you're in a re happy relationship, so I guess. That's why I said it. Well, I have to check out the last technical <laughs> product. You, know, you don't know how much it sucks. I mean, this is what <laughs> the pain that came out. Um, no, yeah, it, it led me to found this company because I thought hey, it's also really, and then I was swiping, you know, I guess like most of us at some point did, and uh, I was swiping, you know, and I got into this 
swipe rage, <laughs> which is everyone goes left, which means no. And then um, I, I saw my ex-boyfriend, uh, who I was together with for four years, who's a great human being. I still think he's attractive, but didn't work out. But I swiped him to the left, and I was like, and I was, oh, fuck, that was my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> just swiped him left. Would have been just funny to, you know, just for the sake of being funny, you swipe him right. And then I realized, okay, back, how many people that are actually like super nice, super cool, am I swiping to the left? Um, and yeah, it really got me thinking. And yeah, so it started with a friend together and um, out of my personal need. And we were on an audio project, on an audio messenger project, actually. And then we converted it into dating. And um yeah, it's just a way nicer, yeah, way to meet someone because 40% um, of our first like uh, impression of a person is based on the voice, and um, if you can bring this into the digital, you can already have like a much more holistic view of someone, and I really like that, and I really like when actually I talk to someone <laughs> and I hear their voice instead of just get a like or like the standard. 12 letter long opener i guess some of you know it hey how are you question mark <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's fascinating yeah so how are you alex <laughs> it's over to you i'm good how are you <laughs> um so my name is alec i am the ceo and one of the six co-founders of endel and endel is a technology that creates personalized adaptive soundscapes to help you focus, relax, and sleep. So when some of you are gonna be trying the app, hopefully you will be trying the app, which there's there's a promo code over there. Keep in mind that nothing is pre-recorded. Everything is generated on the spot, personalized to you, personalized based on things like time of day, weather, heart rate, movement, your sex, your age, your chronotype, stuff like that. Uh, that's what we do, right? Like, and we've some of the soundscapes on the app are uh, created by us internally. Some of them are built in collaboration with some of some amazing artists like Grimes, James Blake, Miguel, Plastic Man, and we even worked with the Alan Watts organization. This is my personal passion project, frankly. Um, so the idea for that is I'm just a huge ambient music, you can say nerd, and um, it came from Brian Eno. I don't know if anyone here knows who Brian Inu is, he's effectively an inventor of ambient music, right? Like, and it was, you know, he did that back in the 70s. And the whole idea of ambient music, uh, according to Brian Inu, is that it's generative. Like, it, it's created by creating these frameworks and just letting the frameworks play themselves, right? So I know I've been, li I've been listening to a lot of Brian Inu when I was working, and then I was like, I mean, the anecdote goes that I just got tired of turning the uh, record because I have you know I listen to music on vinyl even though I'm working at this crazy tech company and I was like but what if we were to take these ideas of Brian Eno of, of, of this compositional approach and infuse them with modern technology right like we have all of these devices on us like Apple Watch and you know we're surrounded with these devices they know so much about us but this data is used just to, you know, it's just presented to you. It's not actually being used by, you know, all of these services around us, or not used in a good way. Uh, let's put it that way. So I was like, what if we were to take all of this information and create sound that would help you achieve a certain cognitive state? And what if that sound would happens to, what if it happened to sound nice also? It wouldn't hurt. And that was Endel. Um, and yeah, here I am talking to you about this now. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, that leads cool. us to exciting this, projects. Yeah. yeah, works. Go ahead. Yeah, and it, I think it's been an incredible journey. I, I met you like four years ago, five years ago, and where you are now, you have a huge um, user base and, and loads of people using the app, and some of the top artists in the world working with you. So well, well done on that. Um, I'm Kalam. I um, I fell into this this space with AI and mixed reality artists. Um, by a very weird method. <laughs> I was actually working in a music technology company called uh, Native Instruments, uh, leading their venture and innovation topics, and had basically all the startups and most innovative people in music and performance around the world pitching their apps to, to our team. Uh, and there were some amazing things going on. I used to get blown away by what people were doing with AI and 
and music and also with uh, mixed reality performances. There were a lot of AI apps. Uh, this is prior to, to what you guys were doing. And, and one, one thing that was consistent with it, I, was, I would get excited by it, but I'd take it to my colleagues, like 500 of them were all music makers, and they'd be like, this is shit. <laughs> and it was just like, what can I do with this as a music maker? And I just thought this, I, at first I thought it's just like, okay, maybe it's just me, maybe it's them. But then when this happens consistently, you have to like question like the motivations of like a music maker and the motivations of an app the, uh, an app creator using AI to generate music that may fulfill a use case like YouTube, audio, right? Getting rid of the artist. And so, so these things are very much working against each other, where the music maker is trying to create something that interrogates a creative passion, a, a form of creative expression, or an idea. And, um, and so I left there with this, with, this, with this feeling like, I need to get closer to artists and see how they would use the tools, because you've got a lot of these stacks for machine learning, which are coming online, and, and experiments with that stuff was, was really weird and gritty, and, and, and a lot of times the musical outputs are not good, but the fact that it could somehow guess machine learning models, like the, there was one by Google called um, Sample RNN, they, they went into their research lab called Magenta, Basically, what they were doing was they were taking statistical probability. Like you train a model on on a bunch of tracks uh, or, or a musical style, and then the model tries to then guess the musical style through an output that where it says this note is followed by this note, and and the next note. This is the most statistically probable note that should come next. And if you do this with enough training data and enough time, enough processing power, like what Google has, suddenly you get music, and it's it sounds weird and it sounds very gritty and lo-fi. But the fact that it was possible was very exciting to me in 2018, I think, 2018, 2019. And, and I wanted to see what would happen if you then gave these tools to an artist, because that was already starting to happen in the, in the creative space. So there were like well-known musicians coming in and saying, hey, I created this thing in my bedroom. Check it out. And everyone was just like lost. What can we do with this? How can we turn this into a product? Um, so uh, so I, I actually landed in this building uh, in, in early 2019. And, um, and was uh, very close to the, the team here setting up the Factory Creators Lab. And through that, I met an artist uh, called Portrait XO, uh, Rainier Kim, um, and also Databots, who are like these crazy machine learning scientists, punk, metal creators. And, and uh, they were introduced to me by Rainier, because she knew I was into gender music. And, and, and they had their first thing that they put out publicly on YouTube, and it was a death metal stream. And I was just like, this is crazy. Like, why, why would you do this? And it probably doesn't even sound good. Death metal generated by AI. And, uh, and I remember sitting downstairs in the cafeteria listening to this and going, this is so crazy because with a lot of like gentle music where, where that I was listening to, it was amazing to listen to these high end audio that was generated as soundscapes or you, there was this uh, like bronze AI, they did this thing with this very famous track and they took all the components and then they created this infinite uh, track from it, which is like, wow, because the producer behind that was incredible. But after about five or six minutes of listening to that, your brain notices the patterns of how it's, it's, it's creating. And so for me, general music was cool, but, but it wasn't sparking these, these magic moments after six minutes. But with this crazy three hour stream, I was just like, what is going on here? That vocal range is not humanly possible. That drum solo is not possible. This thing is just playing. And then, and then after they released that, that literally the next day it was in Vice and they're saying, AI is taking over the planet and creating death metal. <laughs> and I was just like, we're onto something here with, with machine learning. So, so we went down this, this rabbit hole of experiments with, um, with using these machine learning models. The next experiment we did was at Rainier's uh, vocals. We took, took a, an hour of vocals and trained a model on that, and it spat out 20 hours of crazy weird shit. And, and then we, she just went through it all, sampled some of it, and inspired an entirely new direction for an album she's releasing uh, later this year. Uh, and, and that process, those, these aha moments when you're listening to all this audio and you go, wow, it did that weird thing in my voice that I can't do. Wow, it had this phrase that it spat out that, that triggered something in me, was a process that I witnessed again and again and again with each artist that experimented with these models. And it, and it sparked new creative directions each time. So, um, so yeah, we went in this direction of like exploring what you could do with AI and machine learning. And then um, in the process of doing that, COVID hit. Uh, we were, I was trying to figure out how to get 
these artists who are working at the frontiers of of AI and audio and all kinds of like data data to music uh, experiments, how to how to get their works out there? Because you know, on Spotify, they're not trying to make a Spotify hit, <laughs> and uh, but they are really interesting artists and potentially in some cases scientists. So I thought we should do live streams. So we came up with some interactive ways to do live streams where we could use the webcam and and take people's movement and generate um, unique experiences for everyone watching a live stream. And then uh, when COVID hit, we got approached by some electronic music artists here in Berlin to explore how we could then turn all this into immersive live streams, because going into a green screen studio is really boring. Um, and then we ended up setting up a VR company <laughs> with this. And we started using like AI audio ideas and AI visuals in, in our shows. And so this kind of experimentation of the lab, uh, a community called Sound Obsessed with, with the sonic innovation at the core of it, became something that's going into audiovisual. SolarVex is, we had to form a company because we had clients, <laughs> Boiler Room music labels coming to us. So we thought, okay, we're not going to turn so Sound Obsessed into a company. We, we just call Sound Obsessed Labs uh, a company. So that's, that's the two things. But they're actually just one, one unit. And, and, uh, and we have a virtual events company called Inix Space. But, but I think the, the, the main uh, thrust of everything we do is, is within the realms of experimentation, what's possible. We're now also working with quantum computing to generate trap beats, which is kind of weird. So yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there are like so many projects. It's, it's really cool. It's super impressive. Yeah, we, I think for the next panel, we definitely need visualization or we need like this interactive experiment where, you know, we would yeah, play death metal to everyone. Death metal, first of all, and then also interact with the audience here and the like, audience at home. Because I remember this United We Stream experiments during COVID, well, experiments, everyone was dancing and, and, and you know, kind of sending videos to, to his friends, like, hey, we're partying here. And it was so sad to see all Berlin clubs completely empty. And I was wondering if there would be like a technology we could use to actually feel this um, collective energy and power, like despite being locked down in your four walls. So, and I think technology enables that. And I mean, we also would like, we live in a highly digitized world. So we are used to have everything like on the tip of our finger, like the car, food delivery, uh, swipe left, swipe right. You have like a, maybe like a perfect hookup material. You want to fall asleep, you, you use endo. Or, or yeah, well, you're a DJ, you want to feel like the vibe from, from your crowd, you, you can use your technology or you just use AI for, to create your new track. So well, the question to the three of you, how would you, how would you balance, like how far can, can you use AI to create, uh, you know, like the new piece of like, soundscape or the new m music? Or like to predict the perfect romantic partner, and um, how much of the human like, curation and creation should be should be there, and what goes first, and what goes last? Um, I mean, we kind of had to use AI, right? Like AI is a tool, right? Like if you think about this, it's a technology, it's a tool. Like we don't, you, at least we don't do AI for AI's sake, right? Like we we had to create a technology that listens to all of these data inputs and that adapts the sound output to those data inputs. Like that was the whole idea. So a lot is possible, but the way we're thinking about this, the way I'm thinking about AI is like, I'm, I'm just, I'm a product guy, right? Like I, I like to build things that serve a particular pers uh, purpose. It's just like how my brain is wired. Like I cannot just create an abstract thing for its sake. Like I'm always thinking in products. I always want to package things. So when I was thinking about Endel, I was like, okay, this is the product that I want to build. How do I build that? And then we actually started talking to a lot of neuroscientists about how sound influences your cognitive state. I started asking them, you know, how do we, and I didn't even think about AI. I was like asking them questions, how do we create a soundscape that helps you fall asleep or concentrate? Like what goes into that? And the first thing that they said was, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be adaptive. It cannot be just one song or one playlist for any situation, any time of day. It it varies greatly depending on the context. And this is when we were like, holy shit, I guess we're gonna have to use AI. So it was like, it was not like, oh, let's build this AI company. Yeah, it was, it was 
purpose driven, right? Like it was function driven. So to me, AI, frankly, is a tool. And if you, you only use it when, when, when you have to, when, when you're going to have to use it, like it's not a thing in itself, at least to me. That's how I'm approaching this. I guess the question is like, when does it become spooky? When do you have a feeling, okay, ooh, like this algorithm, they know me better than I know myself. And do, do they really do like the right suggestion of like whatever they suggest? Well, there's, you know, we, we got into this crazy situation, right? Like, I mean, I'm saying this, but in 2019, we signed this distribution deal with Warner Music, where we have generated 20 albums, delivered them to Warner Music, and public, the Warner distributed them. I mean, it was not even a, a record deal, it was a distribution deal, but you know, the press couldn't tell the difference between the distribution deal and, and being signed as an artist. So what the press was saying, oh, the end is nigh, an algorithm just signed the deal with a major music label. And we were like, uh, not exactly, but who cares? But it uh, turns out a lot of people cared. That was the, it was, I think it was March 2019. That was the craziest months of my life. Like, because I had BBC and, you know, whatever, Forbes and the Wall Street Journal and The Verge, everyone was kind of writing about this. And Warner was calling me and they were like, stop. Stop giving those interviews. I was like, what do you mean? Why do you want me to stop? Because they're like, because the artists are freaking out. Because the artists think that we're now signing, you know, AI to replace them with technology. I'm like, but that's not what we're doing here. So you see, there's, I think there's a lot of, um, I mean, so I think this whole conversation about, oh, when does AI replace people is so 2019, frankly. I mean, really, I really think that. It's, like, it's I mean, pre -COVID. It's not, people, relax, it's not. <laughs> I mean, still working? Yeah. Um, also, like a lot of people find our app also spooky. <laughs> it just be, a lot, like, because they don't have, like, voice. Like, they just don't use it. They don't love it. I think voice messaging, uh, like, either you love it or you hate it. <laughs> I guess you all have these friends or family. You're not allowed to send them a voice message <laughs> or they will just never reply. Um, and yeah, so that's the first step because it's something very, very personal. Um, but then what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna, like we're analyzing the voices and we can actually uh, do a personality analysis based on your voice. So next month, actually, it's quite interesting. <laughs> we're gonna launch it and um, yeah, people will be able to see like based on the ocean model, like how extrovert are you, la la la, and also sentiment analysis, like, uh, when you actually send someone a voice, you know, it's like, I mean, like Grammarly, you know, for audio, they get the happy smiley or excited smiley or slow down smiley, <laughs> like so fast. Um, and yeah, a lot of people find that super spooky. And we really, like, I think, I, I mean, it's so cool what you guys do. You're really like experimenting and you're in your lab or you're talking to the artists, but they're really educate. I mean, you, you get the chance to maybe educate them. You get to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I feel like we're like integrating like with the masses in an app, just to make it very simple and non-spooky. Uh, yeah, it's still a challenge, um, but yeah, a lot of people love it and they love the efficiency of it because like when you get an analysis of your personality, it's like maybe not 100% accurate, but like it's more like who you really are than you, who you want to be in a way also, especially in dating. I feel like it's a valuable thing to know that. Yeah. Like, who are you, who you want to be, how your friends see you, no? how others see you. <laughs> like three different voice profiles. And I think it's going to be really exciting. And that's true. So you have to push it out to the like, mainstream like, dating audience. And in your case, like, guys, the artists, they are coming to you and they are willing to experiment with um, yeah, with the new technologies and just like infuse it with the AI and see what happens. And it's just like one of them. Like, yeah, multiple tools that is out there to enhance the human creativity exactly. and yes, and to to enhance dating and to enhance the creative process and yeah, that's definitely how how I've experienced it. It's kind of like we're searching for this big button. <laughs> it didn't exist. There was just a lot of pain in terms of setting up systems to to analyze audio and then generate audio and then sift through that audio and come up with something interesting. I would say though that 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 where we are now and so it's 2022 and, and and in the three or four years since I fell into this world of machine learning uh, based models for media synthesis, it's kind of like we're at this point where um, 
I cannot disagree with the fact that it's replacing some jobs. Uh, I think there's, there's this one example I would share where we created, a, a, we created this virtual show called Virtual Unreality. It was like DJs playing live in a MMO type thing. We can go into that another time. But, but essentially what we were trying to do was uh, we wanted to create visuals in the virtual space, uh, so immersive visuals in there. And for the first show, uh, we commissioned an, uh, an AI visual artist uh, called Moises Hexosismos. And uh, he, he trained a model on the brutalistic architecture in Berlin. And, um, and, and he, it, was, uh, it was quite interesting because the, these models just created this morphing dreamlike landscape between the buildings. So we put that into, into the show. And, and usually when you commission uh, someone to create something for a virtual production, you would expect at least like, I don't know, six weeks, 12 weeks for them to come up with something. We had this in three days. <laughs> and and uh, so it was just like, wow, suddenly we have this workflow where we can go super creative on like the virtual shows in a very short space of time by using these models. The actual work itself was quite complex and quite uh, niche uh, to his particular way of doing stuff. But that was 2020, now 2022. We've got some incredible models out there right now. We were just talking about mid-journey. For example, the hey, how are you prompt is for me super interesting because we could put that into GPT-3 and get a whole story out of that as a, as a response to that. But equally, we can, we can uh, we're, we're, for example, we, we did some experiments with, with lore writers creating a, a, a metaverse world, a sci-fi animation. And, and I just needed to create some visuals very quickly for a pitch deck. <laughs> so I took some of this and put it into uh, Stable Diffusion, put it into Mid Journey, put it into, into um, uh, Disco Diffusion. These are three different models, three different ways of training. But they all started out of something that OpenAI created and, and released about a year ago. And you had three different uh, style themes, but they were all like stunning visuals because of the, the text inputs. And I did this in like five minutes. Right, <laughs> and it was just like, all right. So now we can create entire like stories with visuals and 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 put them put them up online as quickly as you want to. For writers, it's great. For people who are concepting out visuals, it's it's it's. I think it can feel threatening, right? I mean, if you're if your whole livelihood is based around visual creation, it's a question of whether or not you use this tool to to go in new creative directions, or you see it as a threat. I think everyone I work with sees it as an opportunity. But I w I'm not surprised by, by people feeling threatened by, by AI. So these headlines are crazy. I mean, when we, we did this experiment for the first Eurovision AI song contest, and we accidentally won it. And the next day, <laughs> the next day on Bloomberg, it was like German submission. And the, none of the teams from Germany, by the way, it's Americans and Brits. <laughs> German, German team sings about death to humanity. <laughs> and, and, like, and, like, and so you know, the sensationalism around, around AI is definitely there to like, get clicks. The, the truth is somewhere in between. It's pretty complex to use, and it's opening up new ways of thinking about media creation and what this all means. I mean, we use it for artistic expression. You can use it for a whole bunch of other things. And I think you also need a bunch of... So yeah, it might make some jobs redundant, but it creates plenty of new jobs as well. So like yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, it creates a ton of new jobs, actually. <laughs> No, like not only technical ones, so it's, yeah, it's like, of course, like, first of all, but then, yeah, I think like curation is still there and uh, even like keeping track of all these models that like, you could use and, um, you know. I think I wouldn't know how to navigate this space if I wasn't working with artists. I think they, they really helped me see the limitations of this stuff and where human machine collaboration can be really powerful and and so that's you know that's a little niche i'm in but that thing is spreading really fast it's uh, these models are stability released like a week ago diffusion this model it's basically open source anyone can download onto the computer and generate visuals now and if you're in discord and in these creative communities now there's just bots everywhere where you can just send a prompt to get a visual back so, you know, when I need to think of a slide deck at two in the morning, I just have to just go and type something in, get a visual back. So it's, it's, it's cool, it's interesting. It's, uh, the use case for the slide deck is probably not what they thought of when OpenAI were spending millions on these models. So. Yeah. 
But yeah, going back to audio, like audio technology, that is the topic of, no, no, no. It's, I mean, like, uh, yeah, uh, AI-infused audio or visuals, I mean, it's all just like your yeah, creative uh, media. So if, if you guys, if, if you could envision like the super wild version of the future, I don't know, in three to five years, um, like what would it be in, in terms of, I don't know, the products you're building or like audio technology in general? I mean, we all know, I guess, this film with Joaquin Phoenix called Her. So where like it starts with, uh, hello, like I'm your AI, or, like voice AI, like let's start, describe your relationship with your mother. Uh, um, okay, I've got you. <laughs> it's installed. Um, and then like, he falls in love with his AI assistant. So, um, uh, I don't know how how do you envision like the I don't know the positive or maybe also the dystopian version of you know extreme use cases of audio tech. I mean, I can tell you the future that I'm building, right? Like for Endel specifically, for me, the end game for Endel is this: just the app is or whatever the format that is going to be in a few years, it's just one button that says play. That's it. That's all it does. Because currently, right now, when you open the app, you basically have to say, well, I want to focus, relax, or sleep right now. And then you get to choose uh, from a catalog of soundscapes, uh, again, some of which are built with like James Blake and Grimes, some of which are built by us. But you have to choose. Uh, the vision that I have is that you press play, and the sound starts playing. And it follows you everywhere, wherever you go. And sometimes you can barely hear that. Sometimes it's like front and center and it shields you from the rest of the world. And it proactively shifts between all of these soundscapes. It listens to, look, are you sitting? Are you walking? Are you working? Are you working out? Are you driving? All of that. And that is possible. That is an absolute reality. What I'm talking about, it's, it's, we're building that now. So to me, what I'm excited about is that sound, and I, I specifically want to make that distinction between sound and music. We don't even call Endel output music. To me, the difference between a soundscape and music is music is designed for conscious listening. Music is something you consciously put on because you want to listen to that song or an album. Soundscape, you, it blends with the background. You don't even notice that it's there. And that's the whole idea. So to me, sound that follows you, that listens to you, that it almost works as an external bodily function that helps you kind of, that improves the quality of your life, that is the future towards I'm building for. And I think it's possible. Like in five years, for sure, we're going to get there. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just jumped in there. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Some of the experiments I'm seeing right now, even the the, the, the same team behind uh, some of the visual models, they're also working on audio. Um, it's conceivable that within a year we have uh, uh, an equivalent to what the visual models we have now to generate soundscapes. That sounds good. Um, it's uh, just from my personal perspective, being very close to the experiments going on and the amount of processing power that they're throwing at this stuff. But at the, at the same time, um, I, I think there is something quite interesting about audio uh, outside of the music use case and, and, um, and the, the, the general things that we assume sound is for. There are very complex concepts like quantum computing that are very difficult to explain that I found, uh, you know, you're in a room with people who are experts in this, and there's a niche, there's like four or five people who are working in audio and quantum computing. You get excited about what they're working on, but then you come out, you can, really can't explain it to anyone else. But when you listen to the music that they create with these models, because it's really the concept of something, bits existing in two places at one, one, one point, and I'm not even gonna get into that. It's just like the, the, idea, the ideas behind quantum computing, the abstractions of how this stuff works, can be translated really well into, into in, and expressed in sound. I know this sounds really weird and wacky right now, but bear with me, give it about a year. <laughs> and, and like, and, um, but I think this is it. There's, there's something really interesting about the way we have this universal language called sound, and, it, it, and we can translate complex concepts into it. I mean, from a 
I'm quite biased as I worked with electronic music makers for quite some time, so we see things in terms of code and maths uh, when it comes to sound production, but also emotion and what triggers emotion. With uh, complex ideas, I think sound can be an interesting way to do it. And this is not a new idea. I think with, with big data sets, this like SETI, for example, they had all these crazy data coming from other planets. Uh, the best way to notice the anomalies was the blip <laughs> in the middle of all that. So, so I think there's something going on there. I think people in general, uh, I'm finding it uh, general, a movement towards more acoustic stuff as more electronic stuff comes out. I don't know. It's like people have waves that go in and out of like things they like. But I think the technology is still some way to go. And, and some other use cases aside from hit tracks on, on you know, music industry. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's like from company product side, it's pretty similar to your one play button. <laughs> I would love to present like the one perfect partner, of course. Mm. So this would be like the best, uh, the best product. At the same time, I, I think like on a very human side, I know that you need to be ready. <laughs> so there's so much like psychology and your own journey going on. So that's the reason for even our name, Waves. It's a mixture from Waves, but also the way you need to go. And you just there's just no shortcut. <laughs> that's the fucking truth. So sometimes you just make some shitty choices <laughs> with your partners. Um, as in the rest of your life, and that's but you needed it, so that's why you did it, and then next time <laughs> it's gonna be better. So that's my really true belief. So even if you would present the perfect person, I'm not 100% sure actually everyone would see it in that moment and actually choose it. So that's like this very uh, other side to it. So, but what I want to achieve with Waves is like through audio, like it's a great way to, to connect way better, right? To feel less lonely. And I feel like there are so many studies on loneliness and it's getting like a much bigger topic. Um, we all know that. And audio is one of the most effective ways to um, fight that, actually. So just by being in the process of dating and you know being on the journey, I would love to contribute to fight that feeling of loneliness for people. Um, and yeah, then until they make it to, you know, not be lonely. Um, yeah, so I, I like that part of my company as well. <laughs> and I think it's also pretty fascinating what you were telling me earlier today that uh, with the help of AI and like, analyzing voice, you can predict um, not only the possible romantic partner, but you, the emotional state you're in. So what would be better for you now, like go on the date or maybe <laughs> let it be, maybe not today, or even like predict um, health issues and like diseases. So I think this is like pretty yeah. wild. Yeah. So interesting what's yeah. already, I not mean, we don't do that, but there's like a German company, you know, they can, uh, just from a phone call, they can tell like how depressive you are, like how likely to kill yourself. Like you can uh, predict Alzheimer's pretty uh, early now. I mean, there's so much from our voice that we can already uh, use. That's because our voice is also very unique. It's like our fingerprint. There's no um, second voice of yours. So it's something very unique. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating topic. And I think that's really there. We're just uh, also at the start, there's so much more to discover when it comes to that. I think it's, it's a good roundup. Maybe, well, I'm just moderating, but like from my side as a podcast host, I think voice and audio technologies are also a good way to take us away from all the screens. We tend to be glued to like all day long, like big screens, phone screens, like Apple Watch screens. So it's good to like just listen to stuff and look around and... Um, and maybe let's open up to the audience and take some questions. Do you want? Yeah, we have plenty of time. So, does anyone have a, a question? Hand. Yeah. Hi. I just want to add um, onto what you were saying about your app. Is that you know I think that it's stimulating the art of conversation again in a way that it sort of died away in the past years. I used to live in New York City. I was on all the early dating apps. <laughs> I also feel your pain. Um, so I just appreciate that this is like a different sort of way in emotionally and finding like that human connectivity. So I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I yeah, feel the same way about it. And uh, actually, like all my previous boyfriends to my online dating. I, I really met in real life and they just approached me 
or I approached them actually also. And I thought just so nice, right? Take up all your courage, old school. <laughs> just talk to people. Uh, I like to recreate that experience actually also in the app. And yeah, I think also people really like it. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Yeah. So this question is aimed at yourself as well, and there's this sort of idea that automation as a as a means or as a as an idea might and might enslave us uh, as human beings rather than to uh, as rather than it being a medium that can augment our lives. So, do you think that this is something that could sort of and uh, be used as a means for uh, means to enhance this aspect of our lives rather than to sort of. Um, to, rather than say to cripple us of of our means of being able to go to an offline event and socializing and meeting someone that way, uh, you know, via traditional means, do, do you reckon that that still has a purpose in our our lives? <laughs> I I don't think yeah. Could, could you maybe which 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 part of life would it yeah? Could you maybe specify the question? I meant like. Um, I mean, uh, like, sorry, her, I mean, her last, her, that bit of her spiel was uh, focused around dating, and that's what I okay. uh, meant. But you, we can sort of apply this to a general sense, uh, whether um, in any sort of any sort of aspect of where, by which automation or AI might uh, might be involved that could have been relevant to this discussion or to this panel. Yeah, I, th I think there's so much more to come, actually, for, I mean, dating. Um, I think it's just the start nowadays. 40% uh, no 40% of couples are meeting online so and the trend is really picking up uh, steadily and also good news um, the relationships are tending to be longer and happier really <laughs> so, yeah it's really cool so online really? dating is not a bad thing <laughs> really yeah the hypothesis around it is that like when you go like when you say okay well i want a partner you know so i download this beautiful dating apps <laughs> and you know I go on that journey then you like need to think more about what you want so and some people you know just end up you know, with someone they just might you know met somewhere and it's not such a conscious decision but yeah yeah sorry I can nerd off for all the dating wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I had <laughs> but no yeah idea. to get back to your answer uh, question um, so so I think like this voice thing it's just a start I mean when just like there's so much more that can be optimized also in the uh, other other senses right the smell uh, there's so much more um, like also video you know that it's it's yeah, that it's, it's so important but in the end it's nothing can simulate the real real life experience and i think it's gonna well i, I don't think i will ever be still alive when there is a world that can really simulate that full on experience so yeah, <laughs> so that's my personal belief because it's just so great that human touch, etc. So I can't, I can't think of a world that uh, will fully automate dating. <laughs> that's also the magic about it that I love. Okay, perfect. Any more question? One last. Oh my gosh. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, I was read about something that you said about quantum computing, quantum computing and music. So uh, what's happening there? And are we making things at the same time in different parts? What's happening also with the co-creation? Yeah, the quantum tools. Qu the, the, thank, thanks, thanks for the question. I, I, I find it difficult to explain what's happening in quantum computing music. Uh, but it's, um, um, I would recommend you follow uh, two artists. One is Databots. Look at the work they're doing. They might release something on Artblocks this year. The second one is Roman uh, Roman Lipinski. Lipinski. He's based in Berlin. He's just try quantum computing Roman IBM, and you'll find it. And he's doing some work there. He's more of a visual artist using IBM's uh, quantum computers, and um, and the Databots crew are working with NASA's, and um, and there's some really interesting weird things that that I don't know how to explain, but when you listen to it, it kind of makes sense. So I'm sorry, to, <laughs> I can't explain it, but, but that kind of stuff is coming out now, and I think it'll be interesting to maybe even 
come back to this question like 12 months from now, like what is this stuff? What can we do with it? Great. Very interesting recommendation. I'll check that out. Um, okay, we can go to you. Here you go. Can you pass it along to him? Thank you for that help. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the panel of like, really interesting conversations that are being had. Um, I have a question for the whole panel. So OpenAI's DALI 2 has been heavily criticized by some artists for using a database full of artists' work who never consented for their work to be used in this way and could have never possibly imagined for it to be used in the way that it has been. So my question is, what steps can be taken to ensure that the um, the artist's work that consists of these databases that are being used to train machine, learn, machine learning models, um, that the artists are being respected in their wishes in the future. I mean, I was reading up, I mean, I think it was David O'Reilly who kind of started talking about this. I'm just a huge David O'Reilly fan. I was frankly stunned by his take on this. I mean, if you follow that logic, that means that I mean, when these people, some of which are dead, you know, have created these artworks, they kind of wanted people to see them, to study them, to be taught how to copy them, right? Like if you go to any art school today, one of the first things that you teach you to do is, you know, to copy somebody else's, someone else's style or work or um, creative or like, yeah, artistic approach. Let's call it that way. So that's exactly what's happening, just using modern technology. And I, I mean, I frankly don't see that much of a problem here. Um, Can I just ask, do you think it's a problem where the artists who make the work rejects the work being used in this way? We, I don't think, I mean, if we're talking about a commercial use of, you know, a of an AI generated artwork that is done in the style of this particular artist, I guess we will come up with tools for people to kind of flag and object and, you know, I think, I think it's just so, I mean, I think maybe starting this conversation now does make sense, yes, but I think kind of objecting to this right now, it, when all of these, you know, models exist uh, as, Discord bots, frankly, that very small, you know, subset of people are using, I think it's just too early. I think it's just putting roadblocks uh, in front of what, it, to me, is a super exciting kind of development of AI and technology. Of course. Yeah, no, obviously, yeah. No, I'm, I'm not arguing with that aspect at all in any way, yeah. I, I would say there's, a, there's the nuance uh, for me observing this stuff is it's that those are very valid questions. And it also harks back to the, the original question around like the, the usage of data in this way and potential enslavement. I mean, I would, I would frame it as such, you know, we're taking large data sets and we're training, companies are training models on this stuff. Without without people's permission, and and we're actually the slaves to them. <laughs> we're if we're not actually creating content, they don't get anything out of it. And then the other side of it is like the devices we use. Uh, we're doing a lot of media creation. In the end, the the processing power behind that is crazy. The amount of energy required to do this stuff, and then the the kind of resources that are needed to make these devices. You know, we're creating enslavement around the world. So this is. There's this crazy bigger picture around like our satisfaction looking something at a phone and how that actually comes to us. But with, the, with, the, with regards to your, specifically your question around artist uh, data, I think it's, it's just too late. I, I, these questions were asked years ago and no one took it seriously. And, uh, and, and we're at this point now where OpenAI just literally went in, closed the doors and did it. Uh, they created that model. We actually created a, a jazz live stream based on, on one of their models, and it sounds amazing. You have Funkadelic, you have Prince, you have everything in there, and it's just crazy that this is even possible. And that was sampled into the first AI rap track that was sold on Foundation for 5 ETH last year. So, so, so this, we're just beyond it now, and I, I think where, where I see the more interesting work 
on what you're describing going into is within these spaces, the artists who now have ownership of these models and are working with other artists and saying, hey, what are we going to create next? Uh, so for example, uh, this artist I mentioned earlier, Hexosismos, he's, he's creating a, a synth, an AI synth, based on uh, a bunch of artists contributing the data to it. In the end, they own the data and they get money out of whatever is sold out of that. I don't know how enforceable any of this, if a big company comes along to, 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 to him or his company and says, hey, we'd like to buy it out. How can you enforce the, the, the chain of the value going to the artist? Big questions. I don't know. But I think we, we're at a point where, where there's, there's open source, uh, training open source, the data sets that have gone into the models that are really popular right now, it's, it's all done. We can't really go back. Um, it's like the, the cat's out of the bag or whatever you want to say, right? Uh, I, I forgot to mention one more artist to check out, Keon Christ. He's, he's working with Databots and, and he's doing quantum, quantum trap beats. <laughs> cool, we'll have two last questions. So we have one here. I have like two questions. Hi. Uh, first is for the lady with the waves up for the dating. So you mentioned something really nice about like the using the like you're building an algorithm or you already built it, like analyzes the voices of the users. So to like gives them an idea of their personality and co. So my first question there is more or less like how do you deal with like a bias in that system whereby like what are the parameters in that for the model to analyze the voice? Are you looking like the pitch of the voice, the tone, like the pattern? Because why I talked about the bias is like, okay, this guy could be an extrovertive guy and he might speak in a very low way, or this guy could be a very shitty guy and he has like this amazing voice. So how do you deal with that sort of bias? <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, there's like <laughs> this sentiment analysis, what I said. So it's really like you're in the moment, you're talking to someone. So maybe I'm a little bit excited, so I talk faster, you know, stuff like that. And that's easy to analyze. But there are some patterns really that, um, yeah, that we, we take these audios also not from conversations, but we ask people to, you know, talk some minutes <laughs> about a question we ask them. So they don't talk to anyone. They just, you know, start like when you do a long voice to your friends, like, oh shit, sorry, five minutes. Um, this kind of voice and we analyze it. And um, so they're like 200 marks we look at. Um, yeah, and, and they're, yeah, they're, and you need a longer audio to, to, so you see this repeating patterns, basically. It's not like, as I said, it's not 100% accurate yet. Um, we're working on it and yeah, also training it. And also I'm going to be, yeah, we're excited to, you know, so because why are we doing it? We are, we are very functional about this. We, we are a voice dating app, so we want to really go deep on that topic and want to deliver value. So we do this for the matching rate, right? Because we want to deliver the greatest partner. And so we really just look at the data of also what's working. Okay, cool. So my question is for the other two. So you, like um, the previous questionnaire like already talked about like um, copyrights and so. So part, part of my question has been answered. So the other part is more or less like what's like the current investments we like. Is there anything like AI copyright law or like, you know, this is like a new frontier for governments. They don't even know how to handle this. Are you guys like working with like governments and like, I don't know, legislatures? to help them like understand and build like the right laws to help the artist and your industry. Thanks. I'm working a lot with my lawyers. <laughs> that I can tell you a lot. Yeah, because we're literally we're developing a, we had to develop a whole legal framework for working with music artists. The reason for that is most of music artists today are signed to music labels, right? Like that means that whenever they create a recorded composition that recorded composition belongs to the label as long as they're signed to the label. Um, so the process of creating a soundscape that we're using is we have those artists creating a stem pack that's called in the professional jargon, or like a sample pack, sound pack, right? So assorted building blocks that they are creating that we are feeding into the algorithm and the algorithm is using as a set of building blocks to generate a soundscape. So the question becomes, what we are saying is, well, 
there is no recorded, quote unquote, recorded composition that is being created here because the composition is created by our technology every time you press play on the app, meaning that the label does not get to be involved on the app, which obviously, you know, robs a lot of people in the wrong way, uh, let's put it that way. So we we're currently, we have developed a legal framework and it is working for us right now, but yeah, I mean, there's so many questions. Like, But then because the question becomes, okay, well, what if we were to export that soundscape from the app and publish this as an album, which we have done with James Blake, actually, because if it was first a real-time personalized adaptive soundscape available only on the Andal app, and then we click the button, and that album was exported uh, uh, as as one hour of music, and we cut it into tracks and delivered it back to Universal, actually, to distribute on the DSPs. So, I mean, I'm not going to get into the legal details of that, but I can tell you it was a lot of work, and there's still a ton of work to go through here. This is like a really complicated question. <laughs> um, I've been lucky in that all the artists I work with are independent, um, and so we've been able to avoid some of the issues you would encounter with a major label publisher and their legal department. Um, I think it's it's the the concepts behind uh, we so we we do a lot of uh, raw audio synthesis. What that means is you take in the audio, put it into the machine, something comes out, and um, and and sometimes and now especially what comes out is getting better and better and and interesting for the artists who submit the original data. The the last thing we did. Uh, it was, uh, we actually did it one and a half years ago, but we released it in January. Um, we uh, trained a, a, an audio model on a, on a band called Silverstein, who are a well-known emo AI, no, emo metal band. And we created an AI version of them. Uh, we basically created like about, I don't know, there were like 2,000 tracks we, we synthesized. And uh, we whittled it down to about 1,000. All of them sounded amazing. They, they, in the style of the band, you know, this is like metal and, and it's very high energy. And, and the, the sounds came out that way, three minute tracks, 1,000 of them. And the band were blown away by the outputs. They couldn't even believe it. And, and they were inspired by some of it too. Um, and when we released it as, as NFTs um, earlier this year, uh, we had this issue, which is just like, what's the licensing around this? Uh, how do we put this out into the world? And, and, and we, we, this took the most amount of time to us and the band. Luckily, it was just us and the band. Imagine it was the, the lawyers, forget it. You know, it would, it would just end up going nowhere. And we settled, we settled in the end on, on, on one, two things. One, there isn't a framework for this. You know, it, when, when, when in history has, has someone generated a thousand tracks that can be covered by a band, right? And, and the second thing is, um, there's, uh, there's this uh, Creative Commons license out there that is, that is usable in this context. Because what, what we wanted to avoid was that someone would take a track and then publish it as an artist, and, and it's suddenly there's a, there's a Silverstein bot running around uh, as, as uh, you know, distributing music and it's got nothing to do with the band. So what we wanted to avoid is that. So we, we released it to this generative art community, it sold out very quickly, and, and then the, this license was there that allowed anyone to experiment with it, but if they wanted to do anything commercial with it, they had to get in touch with the band, because we didn't have a way, there was just no framework for it. And I think uh, to your question whether we should work with governments or, or, or lawyers, I don't know, I just, I just think that I've seen lots of startups die like trying to get into this process of finding a solution. It's kind of like you have to frame the problem in a certain way, which is, which is kind of what you've done. And, and I, I, I feel like we need to accept that it's 2022 and we don't have all the answers yet. And we're trying to retrofit things into, into copyright. And, and there's, there's, there's this great example which you can read up online, look up, uh, so the Databots guys did this <laughs> really naughty experiment where they, they, cre they took Toxic by Britney Spears and got Frank Sinatra to sing it in their, in their voice model and released that as, as, a, as a collaboration with The Verge. And, um, and this, thing, um, this thing blew up, as you can imagine. But then, uh, you know, YouTube has its audio detection thing, right? And, uh, and so this got flagged up a few times and then and then uh, the question of how the, the data that was trained, this model, started to become a topic. 
uh, but this got flagged up a few times, and there was no basis for it to be flagged up. And then the, the, I think the Electronic Frontier Foundation got involved, saying this is fair use of data. And it got argued in the courts, and then it went through the whole process of how the YouTube algorithm actually was. It's really murky. No one actually knows like what's going on in the background. You couldn't like pin down why it got taken down, and and so, so you know this. Th there's. I don't think there's a straightforward answer to this. I think the, the the onus is kind of like on, on creatives to just kind of come up with ways to say this works best for me, and it's not going to be perfect. Like that that artist uh, Ver Verity, she released. Uh, uh, some work earlier this year, and she had a framework around it, also working with Grimes Manager. And, and that came under some criticism because it wasn't well thought through. I was like, well thought through? No one knows the answer, you know? It's just like, and, and, and it's just, you just end up going to circular arguments. I think you just got to produce work, get it out there, and, and just figure out. I, I do have an answer, like as a clothing remark. Oh, remark. perfect. Yeah. So I think, well, but uh, so. It's not there yet, like we cannot use it for the next endo collaboration or like for your artists, but I think the answer is blockchain. So, you know, players like Royo, XYZ and so on. So they will be the salvation for this kind of problems or like just business cases. But yeah, that's the topic for, for the next panel one day soon. And um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I'll hand over to Charlotte. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Please, a round of applause for our moderator and our speakers. Amazing.